Hello and welcome to Plus TV Africa's Democracy Day special. I am Coyote Ladingi. And I'm Mariana Cohn. We're here to mark Democracy Day three years after President Muhammadu Buhari declared June 12 as a new day to celebrate our democracy. Quite interesting. You know, it just, just like three years ago, I remember that over time there had been clamor for the day to be declared as Democracy Day as against the May 29th when power changed hands. In mm. That was like 22 years ago. Yes. But we are looking at 28 years after what that day stood for. I'm sure both of us were alive then, right? <laughs> <laughs> we were, obviously. We were, but uh, most importantly, we're also um, not just talking about that day, June 12th, what happened, um, how power did not necessarily go how Nigerians were expecting it, but then we're talking about 28 years later, uh, how has Nigeria's democracy evolved? Have we changed for the better or have we retrogressed? Quite a big question. Because some would say what we've had so far is civilian rule and not democracy. But trust me, a lot of our experts are going to throw more light on that, tell us how far we've gone in terms of our security, in terms of our economy, in terms of the most important, uh, which is actually the security, because we wonder how we have gotten to this level where there's so much insurrection, so much uh, unrest in different parts of the country. Yes, and we must not fail to understand that, that some of these uh, you know, insecurities are fueled by ethnic tensions. That's true. And this is the most that Nigeria has experienced in all of its life as a country. Yeah, and trust me, we will get started with very, very important one, that is the rule of law. What defines the democracy definitely has to do with the rule of law. And uh, let me not mention the name of the guest. By the time we come back, we will see that the person is fit and proper to explain to us what rule of law is all about under the democracy. All right, well, let's, let's kick start the show. Uh, when we come back from this break, we'll talk about the law that governs us as a people. Welcome back. It's still the June 12th special. President Olusha Obasanjo took his oath of office under the law when he became president in 1999. This did not translate to him leading with the respect for the rule of law. He constantly meddled with legal processes. His successor, Umaru Musa Yaradua, was praised for upholding the rule of law. Yaradua ensured Supreme Court judgment refunding Lagos State old federal allocations was enforced. He also enforced the court's judgment declaring Peter Obi the governor of Anambra State. Well, good luck, Jonathan had relatively good records he, but the president, Muhammad Buhari's record has been filled with numerous abuse of court orders. Judges have been ignored on at least 40 occasions. State security officials have invaded a court to arrest an activist, Omoyele Shore, and also invaded the home of judges. And to do justice to this, we have Moise Banere is here to talk about 28 years after and the rule of law. He is a senior advocate of Nigeria and currently we also describe him as an activist. Just for record, he was one time commissioner of Lagos State for Environment and also commissioner for Transportation. At a later time, he was also the national legal advisor of the ruling All Progressive Congress. Welcome, Dr. Moise Banure. Thank you very My much pleasure. for joining us. Yeah, My good pleasure. to have you. Now, let's take a look at um, the idea of democracy and the idea of rule of law. We believe that these are supposed to be Siamese twins. And there was a situation with our own country. Well, our own country, uh, in, a, 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 in the first instance, maybe I should start by saying that what you said is correct in your introductory remark to the extent that uh, can we really say we have a democracy in Nigeria as a date, particularly since 1999? Well, I share the position of those who believe that the best we've succeeded in achieving so far is a civil rule and not democracy in the proper context. So if you take it from that particular position, rule of law, however, has only one language. And it is that everybody must do things in accordance with the dictate of the law. It's as simple as that. So if we pitch it from that, democracy not yet here. Rule of law is there with us. But to what extent have we been upholding? I say we are still far off. That's my submission. We are still far off. Mm. 
Well, sometime early this year, there was that confusion as to which should take precedence or which should come um, as priority in the country, knowing that we have been facing some form of insecurity over um, since last year into 2021. Um, the president did say something about the fact that, um, you know, um, the rule of law, yes, does have its positioning, but then um, national interest does supersede. It was. It became some a subject of you know conversation and debate all across the country. As someone who's a an officer of the law, do you agree with Mr. President's position as to national interest superseding the rule of law? I, I'm guessing rule the rule of law works with. The well, I do. I, I I don't subscribe to that position at all. I believe that at no point in time must we subordinate the rule of law to any other consideration. Even within the context of national security, there are so many ways to skin a cat. You are still arrive at your destination using the instrumentality of the law. The moment you displace the rule of law, it becomes rule of man. And the net effect is simple. You are entering into anarchy. You become a jungle city. It's as simple as that. So under no circumstance must we allow the rule of law to be displaced. So I do not share that position. You say um, you say under no circumstances should we allow subordinate. Yeah, but 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 are we allowing it or is it happening under our watch? Because well, again, it's happening. We, it's we happening. do not have the powers to allow or disallow, do we? No, no, at this point, it, yeah, it's it's happening. I'm just telling you conceptually what it should be, <laughs> but in terms of being pragmatic. Well, it's happening. What are we doing about it? I think that should be the question. What are we doing about it? Okay, Dr. Banner, before we look at what we're doing about it, you gave a very fundamental issue. And uh, for some people, they believe that um, the political class played into the hands of the former military generals. In 1999, we had a former military general who took over power. And we have some kind of respite when we had a full civilian that talking about Yeradua, and we also had good luck, Jonathan. And we are back to a former general. Is this what is responsible to this unsatisfactory, if, you, if I can use that word, uh, uh, transition that we've experienced so far? Well, I suspect so. I suspect so because they've been living a regimented life all the way, and suddenly they find themselves in an environment that is not a regimented environment. The tendency naturally is to want to apply the regimented, our regimental rules. So for me, I believe that we must have somebody who is devoid of that background. In so far, you see, once a soldier is always a soldier, and will ever remain a soldier, there is nothing you can do about that. So I share again that position that we certainly must move away from people with those military background to somebody who is a civilian and accustomed to the basic rules of civility. How do we move away from it? Because I like to, we were very good at placing the troubles and the problems of our country on the table and you know, pushing that discourse. But what do we do in solving it? So let me start by um, talking about the El Zaki situation, the former NSA boss, um, this uh, Moyale Shoure case. These are clear examples of the rule of law not being adhered to. And we do have a constitution where there's so many laws that, in fact, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of you know, you know, adhering to these laws. But it seems that we have a government that seems to pick and choose when to obey the law, when we, the people, should obey the law and when they should obey the law. But we are in a democratic dispensation. We claim to be in one. How do we get to make sure that our public officials adhere to the rule of law and do not pick and choose when they should, you know, adhere to it? But that's a long talk. <laughs> a long one. Let's keep it short and simple. I will struggle. <laughs> <laughs> In the first instance, to do this, you need an enlightened populace. Our people must know their rights and they must know where the obligations are. Often now, we do not have that. So the first thing that I will advocate is that we need to educate and enlighten our people about the tenets of the rule of law, what the implications are. And until our people appreciate that, that's when they can react appropriately to any violation of the rule Whose of law. Whose job is it to do this educating, aside from the media? Please don't say the media. Well, it's, a, <laughs> well, it's all of us. I would say all of us, all of us, particularly those who are enlightened to be able to enlighten or educate those who are not. 
So everybody is involved in this war. We cannot limit it to the government. We cannot limit it to the media. The traditional rulers are there. The NGOs are there. The civil society organizations are there. The teachers are even there in the classroom. There, everybody okay. is involved. We are all stakeholders in the Nigeria project, and we need to bring them. You see, this again borders on institution. You know, the rule of law is what gives back to institution. Very true. And you cannot have an institution without the rule of law. So, if the institution, one thing we have, and I can say without contradiction in Nigeria, is that we practically do not have institution, much less like strong institution. We practically do not have. Let alone the strong one. Yes. The reality of the matter is that institutions, you remember, you can remember a picture, picture, cast your mind back to the Trump last days in America, how the rule of law played out, mm. how institutions functioned. Mm. You can't. I've said this separately. We don't have institutions. That's the beginning and that's the bane of our trouble. And I give you a good instance. I remember when Magu was not confirmed by Senate based upon the report of the DSA, Department Very of true. State Security. And people started talking, people, journalists, strangely, who should be enlightened, saying that why should DSS be writing against a nominee of the presidency? Ha! Ah. DSS is an institution on its own. It can even write against the president of the country. Dr. Banire, I, I want us to stay on the institution because you've touched the kernel of the issue. But before then, I just want us to clear the air because when you came up with that position that um, let's try non-military background set of politicians. I, I want to believe that you are part of the political class. And we have governors now who have refused to grant autonomy to local government, the top tier of government. As we speak, probably you might give us an insight to what the Constitution really says about these uh, uh, um, tiers of government and the constitutionality or is this a good call for us to have a new constitution has been debated? You see, the problem is that the challenge of autonomy for the Gugal government is not the fault of the governor, it's the fault of the National Assembly, whom the presidency. The law at its stand now is largely ambivalent. It's not that you know, there on okay. the issue of autonomy for the local government. Attempt has been made in the last two assemblies to truly give them or confer on them full autonomy. But I tell you for free that during the Saraki days, I know I was a consultant to the constitutional amendment process. That's true. And we came out purely with a full provision amendment that would confer autonomy on the local government. But that was preceded by the State of Assembly usually through the governors. Very true. Because we needed two-thirds of them. We couldn't get the two-thirds to pass it out. That's number one. Number two, again, is the reality that the president lamented yesterday or two days ago and said, look, our local government has collapsed totally. The governors are just taking their money, the money meant for the people. And so everybody, we are all engaging in this one lamentation upon lamentation. But what are we doing about it? The reality is that we must force the National Assembly to act and act fast in this regard. And the president is said to sign in into it to confer full autonomy on the local government. That's number one. Number two, on the second leg of your question, I do not believe in the amendment process. I believe it's, I've written on it in my column. I said this is just another scam. What do you believe in? I believe in total replacement. And I trace the constitutional history of Nigeria from 1992. But the deputy Senate president said this is not part of the mandate, that this is not achievable. Why is it not achievable? Well, because then he, be, because he said that the, yeah, ignorance. Well, he says that the constitution for, for, for a new constitution to be drawn, we have to amend yes, this right. one to, in, to include uh, a clause that, that says that we true. can draw a brand that new not, constitution. That is not true. That is ignorant. That is total ignorant with due respect to the advocates. So you're, you're insinuating that our lawmakers don't know their jobs? Of course, uh, of course. What are their qualities? So please, let's leave that one. Because if we go that direction again, you'll be making me. <laughs> to go into an area, descent to an area you don't want me to okay, go into. Okay, so let's stay on the constitution. Yes, let's stay on the constitution. The constitution allows you to do amend. It's a constitution. There's something we call, you can amend something by way of repeal. Every day in this country, at all levels of government, we amend laws by way of repeal. You bring in a new one, and in that law, it repeals the old one. Hmm. You don't need a new clause to do that one. What we have now, is full of contradiction, a lot of unintelligible provisions. Like I said, a lot of ambivalent provisions. And it's so voluminous that it makes no sense at all. America is the biggest democracy we have in the world. Have you seen the Constitution of America? It's a pamphlet. 
It's not something as voluminous as this that is contradictory and conflicting all over the whole place. A lot of things that ought not to be in our constitution are in our constitution. We need to expand more than two thirds of what is in that constitution today. That is what is not making the constitution itself keep pace. You know, life is dynamic. The constitution is a living thing. The law, laws too are living things. They must keep pace with development and the dynamism of the society. But when you go and stock some of these things and you make under section 9, the process of amendment practically, practically impossible. Could then you are stultifying your own growth yourself. You are shooting yourself in the leg. I can give you a good, a, a good illustration. The land use that we integrated into the like, constitution. Even in the land use that when you open it, there is a portion, sizable enough, called transitional provision that was meant to just last for a short Period. Yeah. Now, since 1978 to date, nobody can do anything about it. But Dr. Banere, I, I don't want us to forget that issue that uh, Miriam talked about, talking about the constitution, I mean, the institution. Where is the problem? Is it the political will of the political class or the people allowing the institution to be stronger? We had a debate everywhere this morning about oh, whose right it is to protest, you need permission from the police, and there is a judgment in relation to that, that you only need to inform the police. But we saw police telling people they cannot protest. So where does this strong institution lie? How do we build that strong institution? Well, like I said, to a large extent, it's a function of ignorance. By who now? Uh, yes, I was going to go to the, 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 the operators to start with. The approaches of most of the institutions are people that are not even conversant with the Bible that they are carrying. Which, what is the Bible? The law setting them up. I can tell you without fraud of contradiction, more than 90% of those who are the various institutions today have never for once sat down to even look at their law. For once, since they were appointed, they just got appointed to go there and ask the people there, well, how, what have you been doing? How have you been doing it? No, that's all. They don't even know their power. They don't know the extent, they don't know the scope. That's number one. Two, the people themselves are equally ignorant. Mm. That's why they cannot even enforce. They cannot raise issues. Even where their rights are threatened or violated. They can't because it's what you know that you agitate. If you don't know about it, you just keep quiet and just surrender to the will of God. And this is what is happening. So for me, that's why I say education and enlightenment of the people, both the stakeholders and even the operators, is very critical. The law has provided for this. The various laws that set up instrument, a, a institution, we always tell you these are your functions, these are your power, these are what and what. These are your limitations. Those are the things that you govern you and no other human being, no matter how superior the person is. Mm. But what do you find today? Well, um, before we go, because we're almost out of time, finally, I just want to talk about you, your constituency, the NBA. I, every time I have a lawyer here, they say, oh, these legislators don't know their job. What is the NBA doing? What are the senior advocates of this country doing to push uh, and, and somewhat put a burden on these legislators that you have claimed do not know their jobs? Uh, pointing them in the right direction, because if they do know that these people who are learned gentlemen are, know their know their worth and they are pushing for certain things, I'm guessing that they would not have an excuse, as opposed to a populace who do not necessarily understand the Constitution, as the lawyers do. Well, I'm aware that the NBA is playing its role. We do from How time, well are they we do from time to time tell them our position on all the issues. But well, of course, it takes somebody who is interested in even knowing to even appreciate the point MBA makes. Most of the time they make provision, the right opinion, they send to them, but they just ignore them most of the time. So there's little you can do. The only people that can correct this anomaly are the electorate. And that is when you are able to do a lot of things. In other words, reform your electoral process. The electoral process and the system, as it is right now, cannot give us the best set of hands that will paddle the affairs of this country into any uh, success. So we need to revisit that completely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Moise Banere. He's a senior advocate of Nigeria, and he's been our guest on the show today. Thank you so much for speaking with us. My thank pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, it's been a wonderful time. We will uh, take a short break and when we come back... We're going to be talking about the economy. Yes, very, very important. important because the Naira seems to be taking a deep dive. What is responsible for that? We'll get to find out. Stay with us.